So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth for you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I'm overcome by the blow of your head, hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me that I may enjoy life again before I depart and am no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mike, very much, and uh, morning all. Now, kids and parents, don't panic. Uh, We've got worksheets for you, well, for the kids mainly. Um, But before we do that, um, I've got a question that I want to ask us all together. I want us to think about about playgrounds. You know, when, when you go to the park and there's a playground there? What I want to know is, what, what do you think the best thing in a playground is? What's your favorite bit? Ruth Taylor, what's your favorite bit? The coffee shop. <laughs> okay, we're playing the game now. That wasn't quite what I was going for, but start of a 10, what we got? Luke, what's your favorite bit? Football, playing football in the playground. Joseph, what's your favorite bit? What was that? The roundabout? That's a great answer. That is my favorite bit in the playground. One of these. Put your hand up if you've been on a roundabout. Okay, there are a few scaredy cats out there, but roundabouts are amazing. Such fun. And um, you, you know the thing about a roundabout? Actually, this is probably a dad thing. So you're, you're there at a the park, and the kids are there, and they say, can you spin me? And, and you look at the roundabout, and you think, I wonder how fast this thing can really go. <laughs> I'll show the other dads in the park something about giving their kids a good time. And you give it an almighty heave. And do you know what happens? Should we have a watch? Here's a little video clip. Oh, there we go. Oh, man. Hang on. Oh, oh, okay, okay, stop, okay, stop, stop. That's a bit of a dad fail moment, isn't it? You do get those dad fail moments. Now, why, why are we thinking about roundabouts? Well, I think a roundabout is a really helpful way to think about Psalm 39. Let me explain. If you're on on a roundabout, where is the most dangerous place on the roundabout? Where is it hardest to stay on the roundabout? On the edge. On the edge of the roundabout, you have to cling on really tight. But if you're determined to stay on the roundabout, you want the place of safety. Where do you go on the roundabout for the place of safety? The middle, not the coffee shop, the middle. (laughs) The middle of the roundabout 
is the place of safety. Now, I think that pattern helps us understand Psalm 39. So we're thinking about roundabouts. And actually, kids, you've, you've, got, a, you've got a memory verse in your worksheet to learn. We'll think about that right together at the end. So see if you can have learnt it by the end. But roundabouts, dangerous on the outside, the place of safety and security is in the inside. And that's what we're going to do with Psalm 39. We're going to start at the outside and we're going to journey inwards. And, and we're going to see that on the outside of the roundabout, we've got struggle. We've got life is hard. And then as we move towards the middle of the psalm, we're going to see wisdom, that life is short. And then as we get right to the center of the psalm, we're going to find hope, and God is there. Those are the headings. I've put them on the back of the service order, if that's a help to you as we look at this psalm together. We're going to begin with struggle, life is hard. And we're at the outside of the psalm. We're looking at verses 1 to 3, and then verses 12 and 13. And as I read these verses again, just have a listen and, and hear David's honesty. Okay, this is King David who, who wrote the psalm, probably right at the end of his life. He, he has been a great king. He was a fantastic military leader, strong and powerful man. But now at the end of his life, his body is failing him. There's, there's feuding all around him. His enemies seem to be prospering. His life is a struggle. And as he looks at his difficulties, King David writes these words, verse 1. He says, I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while, the presence, while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. When I meditated, the fire burnt. Then I spoke with my tongue. You can hear the frustration, can't you? Here is a man who's desperate to say something, but he's trying to control himself. He knows he shouldn't. He doesn't just want to blurt out these raw emotions. So he's saying, no, put a muzzle on it, David. Keep quiet. Don't, don't dishonor God with your rantings. But by the time we get to verse 12, he, he can contain himself no longer. Have a look. Verse 12, he says, hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. You can hear the anguish, can't you? But it's, it's these words that have troubled me most. Look at verse 13. This is David crying out to God. He says, look away from me that I may enjoy life again before I depart and am no more. Now this is King David. He's a good guy. Okay? He's the best king Israel ever had. But here at the end of his life, right, right in the, the midst of painful struggles, he's telling God, get lost. Get lost. <laughs> he's saying, look away from me, God. Let me enjoy life without you before life ends. Literally, he's saying, look away from me that I might brighten up, that I might smile before I go and am not. Psalm 39 does not have a happy ending. In fact, look down at verse 10. D D David is very clear here in who he's blaming. Verse 10, he says to God, remove your scourge from me. I'm overcome by the blow of your hand. Now here's a scourge. This is, this is what a scourge is. That, that is what David is feeling. He's feeling utterly beaten up. Life is fearful. He's on the edge of the roundabout of life. Feeling hard pressed. It's one of those very hard to hold on to moments. So let me ask you, have you been at that point? Maybe that sums up your 2019. Maybe it's been a really hard year for you. I know that is true for some of us here. It's not always clear that God's been on your side. Maybe that, that's how you're feeling right now. Well, if that's you, notice the encouragement here. God has captured these words to you in his words. Now, I think that, that is pretty extraordinary. If you, if you think through what you've got here, ask yourself, if you were God, 
would you include these words in your words? Because this is your greatest king. This is King David. Okay, he's meant to be a fan of you. And he's ranting at you. He's complaining that you're worse than useless. He's saying life would be better without you, God. You, you, you hear that? You sort of want to say, God, why did you put these words in the Bible? Well, I can only think of one reason why God put these words in the Bible. And that is because God wants us to know that he knows. He wants us to know that he knows that life hurts. That he knows that life is hard. You see, God is not blind to our pain. God is not pretending that life is easy. As David is crying out to God, he's saying, Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Don't be deaf to my weeping. And as you read Psalm 39, you realize God was not deaf. He heard those words. He captured those words to say to each one of us, I hear your cries of pain. And actually, as he, as he captures these words, he's encouraging us to cry out to him. See, God doesn't want us to, to wrap him in cotton wool. He tells us, cast our burdens onto him. Tell, us his, tell him our struggles. You can tell God. Christian believers don't need to pretend that life is easy. We, we don't need to walk around with a fake smile, pretending God sorted everything out. Life's a doddle. That's not the way it works. But as we see this, we want to ask, well, where do you go? When, when you're on the edge of the roundabout, when you're clinging on, where do, you, where do you go when life is crazy tough? Well, the psalm encourages us to step inwards. And as we move towards the center, we're going to see wisdom. Life is short. Wisdom, life is short. We're looking at verses 4 to 6 and 9 to 11 here. I'm going to reread these verses. Listen, as I read them, listen to the repeating theme in these verses. Verse 4, follow with me. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere hand's breadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. And then verse 9, David says, I was silent, I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I'm overcome by the blow of your hands. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Do you hear the repeated refrain? Surely everyone is but a breath. But a breath. Now I've been doing a bit of research, a little bit of Googling. The average breath takes four seconds. You're all going to be timing your breath now for the rest of the service. Four seconds. And actually on a cold day, you can sort of walk outside and you can see how short that is. You breathe out and you can see your breath. And then it's gone. It disappears, fleeting. Everyone is but a breath. And you hear that, and you sort of want to say, well, that is not a great help. Okay, I was looking for something slightly more comforting as we head towards the middle of the roundabout. If someone sits down with you later today, and they're telling you quite how hard life is for them, my suggestion isn't that you say to them, well, actually, don't worry, you'll be dead soon. <laughs> Life's really short. You want more than that, don't you? But actually, as I've sat with this psalm, as I've tried to work out why this order of things, here's what I started to see. These verses, as we head towards the middle, they are not the place of safety and comfort in the psalm, but they are the route to safety and comfort. Okay, at the outside of the psalm, life is hard. How are you going to respond? Well, as we head towards the place of comfort... We need to begin by realizing that life is short. That this thing that you and I are experiencing right now, life as we know it, it, it's the only reality we can sensually experience. But it's fleeting. Now maybe 
Christmas has been a, a reminder of that for you. Maybe you've gathered together with family members. We've got three nephews staying with us. Every time I see them, I realize quite how quickly time moves because they grow so fast and you get caught out by that, don't you? You suddenly realize it's flying by, this life thing. My eldest son turned 16. That was a stark reminder. Everyone is but a breath. You and I, as, as far as this earthly life is concerned, it is here today and gone tomorrow. Everyone is but a breath. And our psalm wants us to get that. It seems to think this is really important for us to understand, that this is the place where wisdom comes from. Because how easy is it to live life thinking, well, I'll, I'll make that change tomorrow. I'll, I'll worry about matters of eternity when, when life quietens down, when I've got a bit more time to think about it. I, I've got other priorities today. King David warns us, no, everyone is but a breath. Life is fleeting. I remember a moment I was um, in Cambridge working as an engineer, and I, one afternoon I sat down with a good friend, and um, this good friend, he just said, you know, tell me the plan, John. What's the plan for your life? How do you see it panning out? And I told him how much I was loving my engineering, and I was going to do that for a bit. And then I quite fancied being a school teacher. Okay, if you're a school teacher, you probably think I'm mad, but I thought I'd really enjoy that. So I said, oh, I'm going to do a bit of teaching, and then I thought I'd go and train, um, go to a theological college and, and train to be a Bible teacher. And he looked at me with eyes of madness, and he said, John, I think that's your plan, not God's plan. You're not getting any younger. <laughs> Which, I think I was 28 at the time. You're not getting any younger. If you're going to do it, go and get on with it. And that was exactly what I needed to hear. In my mind, life would never end. I had all the time in the world to do all the things in the world. But I needed that wisdom. Everyone is but a breath. So the psalm would ask us this morning, how are you living life? Have you got this? Are you just caught on the treadmill of life, thinking it will never end? That is so easy to do. But actually, we're, we're gathered here this morning, right at the end of 2019. Blink, and we'll be back here right at the end of 2020. And the year will have passed. The treadmill doesn't stop. Actually, I've been really conscious about this Christmas. Lovely seeing the church full of people singing carols in praise to King Jesus. But you want to say, do you know that this is what really matters? The treadmill of life will always distract us from it. This is what really matters. David says, surely, verse 6, surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. Now, that is a real danger in Cockfosters, isn't it? I mean, house prices sky high, so of course you've got to work crazy hard, save up to get the mortgage, to get the house, and then work a bit harder to get a bigger mortgage, to get a bigger house. 30-year mortgage, it's okay, we'll get there, we'll get it paid off. Finally, you get there, you get to the point, the mortgage is paid off. You can relax, enjoy life. And then we realize everyone is but a breath. Life is gone. Where did it go? Do you see the pattern of the psalm? Life is hard. The psalm's not going to hide that away from us. But life is short. And so the psalm asks us, what are you living for? What are your real goals? How, how will they shape the next year of your life? What will 2020 look like for you? How will it be shaped by these truths? Struggle. Life is hard. Wisdom. Life is short. But finally, let's just go to the center of the psalm. Here we're going to find hope. God's is there. Verses 7 and 8, these are great verses. Have a look with me. They're, they're massive verses in this psalm. Verse 7, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. That is the center of the roundabout. It's not easy to get to the center of the roundabout when life is really hard. Actually, I've been very conscious of that preparing this morning, thinking there will be people clinging on. And it's pretty hard to hear words which simply says, my hope is in God, as though it's easy to put our hope in God. But, but actually, the way this psalm is written, it's urging us to pull ourselves in towards the center, to recognize the shortness of life, that what we see now is not the eternal reality. There is more. 
and then to see the hope. David says, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. It's a lovely moment in the psalm because in his pain he said, turn away from me, God, go away from me, you're ruining my life. But in his moment of hope, he turns to God. My hope is in you. Because do you see that the compass of David's heart is a compass set in this direction? I think that's why David is held up for us as this great example in the Old Testament. Not because his life was perfectly faithful, not because he didn't do anything wrong. He messed up time and time again. But he was a man who kept returning to this one hope. The compass of his heart was directed towards my hope is in you, God. Now, over the last few years, this has really been on my mind because I've just begun to realize that when I settle down each morning to read my Bible, to to turn to pray to the God who hears every prayer, it just started to dawn on me that, that what I'm doing in that moment is not actually all about today. It's not all about that moment A big part of what I'm doing is setting the compass of my heart, training my heart to be a heart that heads towards the middle of the roundabout, to say, my hope is in you, God. Because there will be a day for each of us when we find ourselves on the outside of the roundabout, in that place of terror and discomfort. And we need to have trained our hearts to be hearts that place their faith in the living God. You might have gone up this morning and just thought, actually, everything's fine, going well. I, I don't really need you very much today, God. I can't think of anything to pray for. Not sure I really need my, my spiritual top up from church. Easy to get caught in that mindset, but, but Psalm 39 is, is given to us to say, no, prepare your hearts for the day of disaster. Teach your heart in every situation what it looks like to turn to God, to know humble dependence on him. Because the day will come, even for those who stand secure. Everyone is but a breath. And we want to share David's hope. In fact, the brilliant thing here is you and I can go beyond David's hope. So David's hope was based on the character of God. He he knew God was a faithful God. Same God, same character for us. But actually, for you and I, wonderfully, God has made his character even clearer. Because right at the center of the roundabout for us is the cross of Jesus Christ. When David says, save me from all my transgressions, that that is the cross of Jesus. When David talks about the scourge, well, Jesus was the one who was scourged for us. That, That was the cross of Jesus where God himself in the person of Jesus stretched out his arms and he died for you and me. And he said, I know that life hurts. As you look at the cross, you can't deny that God knows your pain. But three days later, the empty grave. David never knew about the empty tomb, but but you and I do. And it promises us, this life is fleeting, but new life, everlasting life, that is what we're living for. That is the ultimate reality, not this. So Psalm 39 is is simply saying, look, will that be your hope? Will these truths be the truths that shape your 2020? Will it be a year where you are determined to teach yourself each day, my hope is in you, God? That's the memory verse the kids have been learning in their booklets. Psalm 39, verse 7, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Those would be great words for us to commit to memory for 2020, to remind ourselves each day as we seek to train ourselves to put our hope in God. I'm going to pray. Um, Actually, I'm going to invite the musicians back up, and then I'm going to pray, and we'll go straight into song. We need God's help, don't we? Let's, um, Let's pray to him together. God, our Father, thank you that you know our pain. And thank you that there is hope in the pain. That as we look at our lives, as we see the fleetingness of them, as we feel despair from our hopes not working out the way we want them to, 
Please, God, our Father, help us to train our hearts to put our hope in you. And I pray that for us as a church family too, Lord, that we would be a church encouraging each other in these truths, that when times are hard, we would not be shy of pointing each other to the eternal hope that you have given us in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.